Well, thank you all both so much. Now we have a, a few minutes for questions from the audience. First, the ground rules for the questions, for those of you who haven't been to the forum before. First of all, all questioners ought to begin by identifying themselves. That's rule one. Second rule is one brief question per person, one per customer, no speeches. And the third rule is that questions end with a question mark. So we have uh, four microphones scattered throughout the forum. So you, if you have a question, you should uh, line up it, go, go to the microphone and uh, ask it. And please identify yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Lakshman Ramamurthy. I used to work at the US FDA and also uh, was on the Hill several times um, testifying on various FDA issues. So this is of great interest to me, issue of politics and government. I have one question, no comment. Um, the issue of transparency has always been a problem with all governments. The famous one is the Watergate, right? But in those days, the media had a specific role in being the watchdog and the fourth estate. More recently, do you believe, this is the question part, do you believe the media has abrogated its responsibility that they are more becoming infotainment and not information, the wolf blitzers and the others of the world, and only now Jake Tapper has grown some muscles and so has Chuck Todd, have they been missing in action all this time? Thank you. That's a good question. Role of the media in secrecy and accountability. Uh. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I think that the um, arrival of the uh, new era of uh, social media, instant connectivity, involuntary transparency, where <laughs> transparency is forced upon people. The, the tapes, WikiLeaks, Snowden, the uh, Romney's 48%, um, infotainment, uh, reality TV. I'm amazed it took as long as it did for Donald Trump to be foisted upon us. And I think that the traditional media was slow to know how to react. And I well understand, for example, the he said, she said uh, obligation, the, the virtue of balance, the importance of balance, and the feeling uh, that there should be a wall between editorial and reporting, and that the reporting, they give you the facts, you make up your mind. But when you've got a political virus in our system, which is what Trumpism is, you can't uh, maintain those practices. I believe the media was operating in good faith, and I think they're still adjusting and figuring out how to respond. I know that I had somebody say to me, uh, as a talking head, Norm, you're a changed person. You were so moderate and balanced when uh, you would, uh, you know, when I was ambassador, I'd go on. I, and I, but I think the change is necessary because of the nature of the threat to our democratic institutions. We need to be even more vigorous. Despite that, I try to be balanced. I don't only oppose uh, everyone in the administration. When people do good things, I say so. I've supported some nominees. I'm, I've said nice things about Judge Gorsuch. I'm likely to endorse him um, without reflecting on what an appropriate process should be. So I try not to be reflexive, but we experts have to be more uh, vigorous in our advocacy on behalf of truth. And I think the media has to move it to an advocacy posture as uncomfortable as that may be, given what they're dealing with. Mary. Um, well, I don't think, as we all know, there's not one media anymore, right. if there ever was. I have been impressed writing about presidents and their secrets, how often the, the triggering revelations do come from very tough, sometimes risky reporting, sometimes with difficult judgment calls about whether the information should be out there or the information should be kept confidential. Um, certainly there's a lot of media now that's just um, entertainment, 
but, but uh, there are some very hardworking reporters and now links am among them all over the world who are still trying to speak truth to power and find out what's going on um, behind the scenes. So I, I'm, I'm reasonably confident. I think there is a danger in these data, what I would call data dumps, not journalism, uh, large amounts of classified documents that are put on the web directly without anybody yeah. filtering them. The media in the past, traditional media, has done a reasonably good job much of the time of saying some of this stuff we shouldn't print because it is dangerous to the country. We don't have that reliable filter anymore. Good. And we shouldn't forget that a huge amount of the financing for traditional media has moved to new media, right? Those are advertising dollars and um, the advertising, the, the internet platforms of Twitter, Facebook, Google, the big ones have, are not either hiring Woodward and Bernsteins, nor do they have a Woodward and Bernstein ethic in the design of the algorithm. So that's a larger question for what the fourth estate is exactly right now. Yeah. <coughs> Jay Gleason. Um, how do you make uh, drone strikes uh, more transparent? Uh, obviously, we know they're going on, but they uh, necessarily require an element of uh, surprise and secrecy, which results not only in the person who's being murdered, not having due process or any kind of trial, just being designated by certain secretive parties as being someone that's a, a quote unquote terrorist. What was the first and a lot of uh, innocent people oftentimes uh, being killed or wounded in the bargain. So are you supposed to just know that they, uh, these types of strikes exist? Are you supposed to know in advance who's being targeted and why? Are you supposed to know the names of the people that are, that are killed in, in the process? Uh, it's very murky, and uh, you really haven't specified uh, how we're going to contain that. That's a good question. I, I, it's a uh, part of a chapter in your book. The, the I'm not sure I understood. The, I'm not sure I heard the first sentence you said. You said, "How is it? How do you make what?" More? Drone strikes. More oh, drone trans, strikes. Drone strikes more transparent. Oh. Yeah. Um, the military action question. Yeah. I think that's. I think. I think that's hard. There are a lot of. Now, there are several groups who are responsibly trying to accumulate the data. I think the data is always difficult to get because the drone strikes are often in completely out of the way places. I think the best way to go about it is to have um, a, a government requirement that, that the data be released by the military in, in, various, in various categories. Um, I think President Obama came close to making that commitment if he didn't fully um, make that commitment that, the, that he would release the information about civilians um, killed, about strikes that missed the, the target. But I, I don't think we'll ever get that from an investigative reporter or eyewitnesses. I think it has to come from a government database and it should be required. President Obama, I will say uh, uh, President Obama took some steps uh, towards the end of the administration. More needs to be done. This is one of the hard balancing issues that we talked about. Um, I think there's an important oversight role for Congress. There are times when you have competing uh, moral imperatives. It's the hard edge as an ethicist. That is, uh, the, those are the hardest ethics questions when you have clashing imperatives. I know, because I know President Obama and many of the others who were in the decision loop, how they agonized over uh, the drone, both the policy and the implementation and how the president struggled with this. I will say uh, that one of the biggest surprises I'll say this generally, I'm not reflecting on drone policy specifically here. I found that one of the, my biggest surprises in coming in with the Obama administration with a very forward-leaning openness policy, the president signed a memorandum, uh, his, one of his first five acts, uh, when we were all sworn in, actually, I was there sworn in when that memorandum was signed, um, that the, <clears throat> permanent uh, bureaucracy, and I love them, and they were my colleagues when I went into 
foreign policy at the State Department. Uh, there is a permanent uh, bureaucracy, and there's nowhere in government where it's stronger than in the intelligence community, and they zealously guard their prerogatives, and even for a president, even for a president, is, and I think Donald Trump is finding this out now with the huge blizzard of leaks, the involuntary transparency that surround him, surrounds every decision he makes. I read in the New York Times today that his aides didn't know where the light switch was in the cabinet room. So that's the level of granular leakage <laughs> that's occurring. I think it's particularly difficult uh, to, to strike these balances when you're dealing uh, with the intelligence community, and it's just a place where we, as citizens, need to continue to press. And the place where we can do that, I think, is congressional oversight, and there should be more robust oversight. And there were some very interesting clashes, for example, over the uh, release of the CIA torture report and the drafts, and there was a fascinating battle about, uh, uh, really, that was one of the ugliest of the pitched battles between the president and his own party over the drafts and the examination uh, and uh, uh, the prerogatives of the legislative and the executive, I think that's a good thing. I think there should be tension, even own party tension. And I'll make a prediction, you are going to see a lot of that same party, <laughs> legislative, executive, and even judicial tension in the years ahead genius of separation of powers. <laughs> Hi there, uh, my name is Jordan Asher. I'm an education consultant here in Boston. Uh, and I think my question is around a lot of the things that I think people find so alarming about the current moment is that President Trump uh, seems either unaware or uninterested in many of the norms and conventions that have governed politics. And maybe subsidiary to that, it seems like his party is willing to more or less go along with most of that. I guess my question is, I, you know, you guys have listed out a range of options that the public has to increase transparency, and my question is, are those, are those norms, are those institutions, those sorts of, is the political gravity gonna hold in this moment, or do we need to adapt those norms and institutions to actually, you know, impose accountability more forcefully, and, and if so, how do we do that? Mm. Are transparency advocates fighting the last war? Hmm. Um, I, I do not think that, the, that we know what the 21st century digital transparency will look like or even should look like. You know, this is not a, secrecy has, and transparency has never been something, despite what I agree with Norm about the Freedom of Information Act, but in general, it's not, somebody doesn't pass a law saying this will be secret and everything else will be public. In general, it's kind of a pointillist technique. You know, a, the president will make small decisions not knowing that they'll have big consequences. And then over a period of time, you can see the shape of secrecy. I think in the Bush and Obama administrations, we learned that it's much harder for a president to keep secrets. And it's not probably in the, in the president's political interest. President Obama made a bold promise that whenever he had to keep something secret, he would insist that there be oversight by Congress and the courts. The public, I don't think, any longer buys secret oversight. I think the public doesn't buy oversight by four leaders in Congress or eight leaders in Congress. The public actually doesn't buy Congress anymore. <laughs> but, but open oversight uh, would, would work. So the reason I, I suppose that I started on this long trip of writing this book was to try to figure out t what we can say about 21st century secrecy. But I think Norm probably has even better ideas. Well, in, in my other life, uh, not as a officious intermeddler in American politics, I study this question, and I've just written a report, which Archon was kind enough to be an early reader for, uh, about um, evolving norms of, uh, of, of uh, forcing transparency. How can we design systems that force transparency uh, when leaders don't want them? That's the cutting edge of research. Uh, I do think that the, uh, you know, things like the, the White House visitor records they're designed, and I, 
I think it's no secret for me to say there was a big battle about that in the White House, whether we could do that. And some of my colleagues felt that we were consigning ourselves to, as an administration, uh, to uh, constant uh, uh, attack by putting these visitors on there. Of course, it turned out to be quite the opposite. Uh, people, because White House staff and visitors knew that their meetings would be on the internet, they didn't have meetings that they shouldn't have, by and large. <laughs> so I would, I would describe that as a self-executing uh, mechanism, and one that, once I left, would have been very hard for anybody, and I don't, it doesn't seem that the Trump administration is going to take it down. I hope not. We need to have more. We need to think about that. As we design transparency systems, we need to think about how we make them not just resistant to political uh, opposition, but actually uh, uh, triggering of political compliance with the popular will. Thank you. Up here. Hi, my name is Reed McMurchy. I'm an undergraduate. Uh, my question is, uh, Secretary Clinton clearly paid a price uh, for her lack of transparency, both with the Clinton Foundation and with her emails throughout this campaign. Yes. And I'm curious if you think the mistakes and deception she had throughout the campaign will have an impact on transparency in government in the future. And on political candidates. Yeah. Wow, that's really, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Um, I think it would have been wiser to, I'm of the school, I'm, I'm only in the uh, 10th grade, or I've only been in the school for 10 years, so I don't know, that make make me a fourth grader. But I'm of the school uh, that uh, you take your greatest weaknesses and you turn them into strengths by using them, by aggressively embracing them and using them against your adversary. And while I have the greatest respect for Secretary Clinton, former boss, I worked with her, and I, I like her. I think she's a terrific person, a very ethical person. I don't think that, for whatever reason, uh, that did not happen in this campaign, and uh, I think that that uh, was uh, the failure. Trump uh, had far worse ethics and secrecy, e evidence and email spoilation issues, uh, and um, uh, I think that uh, 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 that uh, it should have been, the campaign should have been about an affirmative policy, much more to, to be transparent. Uh, and uh, I hope that future candidates will learn from that, including when they're running against uh, Mr. Trump. I do, I do think that candidates are on notice that the, the public um, cares cares about those, those issues, the, um, I, I think it was, um, as, as Norm said, the public at various times said in, in many ways, we don't really like either of these candidates. I think it was a very odd, odd election. It raised the issues of, of, of emails and classif classification that in a perverse way I was glad to see because Nobody thinks the system of classifying secrets is a good one. It, it has been criticized since the 1950s when it first really went into robust effect. So I think part of the problem was that in the case of Secretary Clinton, we were arguing about a system that everybody agreed wasn't very good and the FBI had different standards than the State Department and the CIA for what they classified. And that, that was exposed. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to have led to any, anything, um, anything better. But I, but I do think that future candidates, we want good people to run for public office, so we don't want to torture them, but uh, future candidates know that, they're, that the public's gonna look at their past record and see whether they seem to have been open and trustworthy. Very good. I'm afraid we have time for just one more question, so the uh, you, sir. And I love how the questions phone. come from all directions and all <laughs> levels. It's like theater in the round. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Sarah Grant. I'm from the law school. Um, I'm curious, you know, of course, the uh, 
preference is that we have open and honest government, um, but given at this point that misinformation seems strategic or sometimes just compulsive, um, which do you think in the long term is more detrimental, secrecy or misinformation that clouds out whatever mm. honest information we might be getting? Wow. Well, good question. I, oh, well, I'll just briefly say I think they're partners. I mean, secrecy <laughs> allows misinformation to, to thrive for long, um, for long periods of time. So I, I, I view them as, as colleagues in frustrating our attempts to get good and accurate information. But uh, go I on. would make the same <laughs> point the other way. It's like asking me which I'd rather die of, uh, you know, uh, cancer or Ebola. Uh, I don't relish either, and the same, is, the same is true. There's a set of corresponding virtues that go with all of the ills of secrecy, misinformation, unethical behavior, corruption, stupidity. Uh, and uh, I, I think we need to embrace those virtues and we need to continue. It's a, there's a, it's a dark cloud I wouldn't have chosen, but there are many silver linings and one of them is the rebirth of activism and the sense of personal ownership of our democracy that so many people feel. I, I will say that, uh, and I think embracing those virtues, demanding those virtues of our government uh, is part of that sense of ownership. I felt when I was in government that the secrets were absurd. There was, it was so much more <laughs> than was needed. I strictly abided by it. I did work on Good some classification. I worked on two EOs to try to simplify classification, but I think we could do with a lot more openness and a lot less secrecy, and we would not be not only be just fine, we'd be better. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's uh, I I love tonight's discussion because it it focused us on the current moment, which is where people begin, but it also had a lot of historical perspective, not just to the Obama administration, but but well, well before, and that's very important because we're not, the, the amount of secrecy and the lack of transparency that we feel in the current moment is not anomalous. It's the norm rather than the exception. And part of that is because presidents want to do things and are afraid that others will react badly, but it's not just presidents. That's what we've been talking about tonight. It's, Every organization is afraid of being transparent. And so, Norm, you are working in government, a real outlier in <laughs> right in the inside of the machine thinking, oh, these secrets that people are keeping, that's ridiculous. But everybody on the outside shares your view of any or that we just want to know more. And guess what? It's not going to be that big of a deal. But the central tendency of any organization is going to be to keep things closed. And that's why we need great scholarship and activism and uh, litigation strategies if that's what it takes to keep these organizations accountable because that's what our democracy requires. Thank you all very much for your you great all. questions. Thank you guys. Thank and let's you. give a big hand to Ambassador Norm Eisen and Mary Graham. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night and I hope you'll join us for future events. <laughs>